So we're going to talk about rural surgery. Uh, this is an example of the sort of realm that uh, many of us have the privilege to work in. This is southern Colorado. I have nothing to disclose except I am completely invested in my community. And that, I mean, that this is not about how great my life is. It's to provide care to rural patients. Uh, it's a desperately needed service. Now, um, we'll talk a lot about different things, but I thought that you ought to have uh, these three references, which I consider sort of biblical in their scope. Um, Dr. Cogbill's uh, current problems in surgery in May of 2012, uh, selected readings last February that Lou uh, Flint put together, and the Surgical Clinics of North America, December 2009. Um, if you want to know about the state of rural surgery or any question about it, these overview type uh, references will lead you in the right direction for further study. So I wanted to say that Dr. Antonico's uh, talk yesterday pretty much covered the whole thing and that we, we have a tremendous need. There are 60 million people who live in rural environments and I'm not talking about you know, suburban Dallas, but places that are isolated. There are 7 million, uh, about 7% of the general uh, surgery workforce works uh, in the rural environment. Now we've been talking this morning about the fact that most uh, general surgery residents go into fellowship. While the numbers may be slightly different than what Dr. Antoninko mentioned, if you have about 1,200 residents per year graduating, only 10% of them are heading into real general surgery, and 10% of those go to a rural environment, that's uh, about 12 people. Uh, I know for a fact there are at least 1,700 uh, rural surgical jobs out there, and uh, at 12 per year, I think it's going to take a while for us to uh, fill the gap. Uh, furthermore, uh, my age is over 55, and uh, I, I really don't want to practice until I'm 80 or until somebody tells me that my Aricept dose has to be doubled in order to stay in practice. And somebody's got to take care of me because I don't plan to live in Dallas when I retire. Did I being sent myself? Yeah. The problem is not that there's a shortage coming. It's here. It's here right now. I'm going to check, uh, let's see. Now I want to uh, say that people sometimes come up to me because they've identified me as someone in the college, and they say, why should I be a member of the college? And this is a story I like to tell. I was minding my own business in my office, and a phone call came through and it said, Dr. Richardson uh, from Louisville, Kentucky wants to talk to you. Well, I'd sort of recognized that name, and uh, as soon as I sat down, I picked up the phone and uh, he said, this is uh, Dave Richardson and uh, I want to talk to you about rural surgery and could we get together at the next clinical congress? I'd like you to get some rural surgeons together so I can really get the on the ground look at it. So I invited the chiefs of surgery of several departments, uh, Danny Pugh from Athens, Texas and Phil Carapresso, Kiaka, Julie Tanyers. <coughs> She was in McCall, Idaho, she's now in Mount Shasta. My partner, Clay Fetch, and myself. And we had risen to our uh, chief of department uh, levels because we were pretty much the department. And uh, so we sat, and Dave Richardson, um, Dave Richardson uh, uh, talked to us for an hour and a half. And at the end of the breakfast, he said, we're gonna do something about this. So I'm still minding my own business, and a phone call comes in again, Dave Richardson's on the phone, can you come to Chicago and present to the Board of Regents in February? Um, yes, of course. And I invited Phil Caripresso to go with me because I was afraid to go by myself. And uh, we presented the case for rural surgery to the Board of Regents. Um, had no idea what to expect, and what we got was a lot of uh, positive reinforcement. In June of uh, 12, uh, the Board of Regents created the Advisory Council 
and we had our first face-to-face -face meeting in the clinical congress in October, but we had been doing a lot of digital communication before that. We had a winter meeting here in February 2013. I'll tell you a little bit about the outcome of that. Um, and uh, actually, we're having a fourth meeting. Uh, our third meeting actually will be in April, about two weeks at the advocacy uh, conference and leadership conference. And then uh, we'll have our third meeting in the Clinical Congress on the 100th anniversary. So you know, every uh, council has to have a mission statement. So I wrote one up. And uh, you know it has the appropriate uh, kind of uh, flowery language, but Jim Elsie, who is the regent for the ACRS, came up with what it, what we really do. We need to recruit rural surgeons. We need to train them, and we need to support them. Um, and that's what we're going to do. So, are we doing something that means something, or is it a thirty thousand foot view of things that you ought to do this? And here's a whole lot of bureaucratic stuff that you can do. Uh, at your hospital, and we want to take a pragmatic approach. Um, the Menthofer Foundation at Cooperstown had long uh, done the rural symposium. Uh, Dr. Antoninko hosted one in uh, Grand Forks uh, a few years ago, and uh, through Dr. Satchdeva's support, uh, the rural, sur rural Surgical Symposia and the Rural Skills course is going to be part of uh, uh, life for the college moving on. The skills, the skills course will be under the Division of Education, and Dr. Satchdeva has said that we'll uh, continue to have that at the Clinical Congress. The sim next symposium will be in 2014, uh, and these conferences uh, look at things not, not just uh, data, but how to, how to make things work in a rural environment, the larger issues of the economic impact of having a surgeon in your town, the impact of morbidity and mortality if you do or don't have a, a surgeon in your county or town, uh, and it can inspire surgeons to go back to lead in their own rural environments uh, as they go forward. The skills courses, uh, Dr. Antoninko talked about how fast you can erode your uh, skill that you learn in a short course. So we pick things that you are going to do when you get home, uh, things that have come up, things that are now standard of care and you ought to be able to do. Uh, at the first skills course, I learned um, the saline lift technique for uh, polypectomies that I hadn't been doing, and, and now I just the intimate part of my practice really helped me considerably. Um, Mike Serup, who is chairman of our uh, Committee on Fellows, uh, is initiating a cancer treatment uh, program for rural America. We recently uh, saw an article saying that the standards for cancer treatment were not the same in rural as in, as in uh, urban. We don't like that very much, uh, and we're going to change it. However, it's important, as Dr. Antoninko said yesterday, sometimes what we do is quality out there because there isn't the infrastructure required, and the patient wants this this way, uh, as opposed to us saying, oh, no, 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 you must do it this way, and you must go 100 miles away to get it done. Um, we're not going to replace rural surgeons unless we do recruitment. We're, uh, many rural surgeons have shadowing programs for pre-med and medical students. We're going to create templates and interactions with medical schools. We've talked to every dean of every medical school in the country uh, and have been provided with names of students who are already interested in rural surgery. Uh, Medical school, student rotations need to occur early on in medical school and then be followed up in the later years as people's interests uh, grow in it. And then Dr. Uh, Walker will talk about surgery prep courses and uh, how they can uh, be used to uh, improve the lot of uh, residency training. And we're still doing other things. Uh, now, Dr. Sticka and Antoninko and others have programs with rural surgical tracks. Uh, the ACRS would like to take those models and promote them to other places that are interested in developing these tracks. And a number of places have already stated an interest. So with rural tracks, you have people who are ready to go into surgery with or without the fellowship. Now, a lot's been talked about the fellowship. And I'm going to tell you, I'm just a pragmatist. 
I've got 12 slots a year right now. I don't care how we get them, we gotta get them. And if a fellowship program is another pathway to it, I'm in favor of it. Um, there, have, there have been some negative comments about it, like it's a finishing school and such. I can tell you when I started practice in Dallas, I could practice in urban Dallas, no problem, coming out of residency. But you have to learn how to think 12 moves ahead in rural surgery, because that blood bank is not there. The equipment may not be there, but the patient is there. Um, we will work on uh, infrastructure next Thursday. We're uh, having a conference call and developing some research on it doesn't do any good to drop, drop that surgeon into the middle of, of nowhere and say good luck. There has to be infrastructure around them. Ultimately, this will probably look like a rural center of excellence so that you can go to your administrator and say, this is what you got to have. If you don't have this, I'm not coming. And that's a powerful influence to, to get the support you need in a rural environment. We need statewide networks so that to the medical schools and universities can work with the rural surgeons as opposed to the Friday night call going, I can't believe that guy from McPherson is calling me again. Um, Dr. Anthony who also related that. We gotta figure out a way to relieve call. I don't think money is what drives medicine. I think call is. And after 30 years of call, I'm getting pretty tired of it. It's like radiation, it's cumulative, and it's fatal. Um, we're studying regionalization strategies. Let's face it, we're not gonna hit this deadline. Uh, we better be realistic about that. And so we need regionalization strategies that work and are flexible so that when we do get a better rural surgical core established that we can fill in the blanks and make it work for everybody. Um, so in my first slide that had the Piper Cub flying over the Midwest uh, in the article that was written in 2007, through the help of people like Dr. Richardson, Brent Eastman, Dr. Seth Steva, Dave Hoyt, uh, we now have a much more effective vehicle to move forward. I think our airspeed's gonna be a little faster and you're gonna hear the sonic boom of the ACRS before long.